everyone, Katie Kimball here for the Healthy Parenting Connector at Kids Cook Real Food, where as always, our mission is to connect you, parents who desperately wanna raise healthy, independent adults with the experts who have the information you need. Today, we're gonna to be talking about homeopathy with one of, I believe, the foremost experts in North America, Joette Calabrese. And Joette, I am so honored that you're here with us today. Thank you very much. Oh, it's my pleasure, Katie. We're gonna have some fun today. We are, and you know, here's the thing. In my family, it is so one of my values that I raise my kids to have agency. I want them to have agency in the kitchen and feel like they know what they're doing. And I want them to have agency in their health. I never want them to feel like they have to depend on a phone call or a Google search every time something goes wrong. And I've taken one of your classes and I'm loving learning more and more about homeopathy and natural health. So although this may be a, maybe a new subject for some of you listeners out there, it is fascinating what we can do to take care of our kids. So the official introduction to Joette is that she is a mom of now grown adult children who never, never took them to the doctor and used just homeopathy, clean food, and what is it? Guts, spunk, and moxie. <laughs> Something that all of us need a lot more of. It was, it was years ago, nearly 40 years ago, that Joette became convinced that homeopathy was the way to go. She's since done dozens and dozens of different kinds of trainings and certifications, including time in India, studying with the founders of the Banerjee Protocol, and has sort of shifted from what's called classical homeopathy to practical homeopathy, including writing her own sort of resource book on the subject. And although Joette had years and years in clinical practice working with, I'm sure, thousands of clients, many moms and grandmas who feel just like us, right? We want to keep our kids healthy. She's actually now focusing on teaching this, what we're doing right here, right? Educating people about practical homeopathy, creating courses and writing blog posts. And she is, she's a fantastic, fantastic source of information. I'm truly honored, Joette. Why don't you, why don't you help us, give us a visual back into your life as a young mom and what convinced you about the power of homeopathy? Yes, I'm happy to do that. So I had been a rather sickly child myself, lots of allergies, food intolerances. We're talking about the early 50s. Uh, my mother was uh, someone who was, a, she was a seeker. She was always looking for answers, went conventional route, then um, chiropractic. In those days, there were no naturopaths per se, or functional MDs. Um, but there were chiropractors. She took me to many, many different sources, um, uh, paradigms and um, nothing helped. And so um, when I turned to be around a teenager, things got a little bit better, but they more shifted. Instead of having being blanketed with eczema, I ended up with gut problems. And of course, meanwhile, all during all of this, uh, most people who know that they have food intolerances, et cetera, et cetera, know that a lot of it has is related to the gut flora. And why would my gut flora be so bad? I was nursed. My mother was a very healthy young woman when she gave birth to me. It was the fill in the blank antibiotic. So anytime I had an ear infection or a strep throat, antibiotic, 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 and, and it was, um, it was uh, just a part of my life. And so I, that was, of course, what stimulated this problem that I started to have um, as an infant even, because that's when it all began. So when I finally um, had my own children, and I had them a little bit later in life, in my late 30s and early 40s, when I had my first child, um, I had been already reading and researching about alternative uh, medicine. Um, botanicals, I had, of course, used supplements. That most everybody, when they first step outside of the, the conventional drug paradigm, go directly into vitamins and supplements. I had done that, was rather unhappy with that, did not find enough value from that. I started to study botanicals, love botanicals, herbals, love them. I think they're very valuable. Um, but I was pregnant with my first child, and I wasn't sure how I wanted to have him inoculated, if you know what I mean. I have to be very careful about these words these days, but at any rate, I wasn't sure if I wanted to uh, hold off from the infancy and wait until he was a little older, or if I wanted to perhaps um, have them administered separately instead of all in one or all in two or three. So I, I did a little research, but I had, there wasn't a lot of research in those days. We're talking the eighties. And of course there was no internet, but a friend of mine invited me to go listen to this medical doctor who was um, traveling the country and teaching mothers and grandmothers, key nouns here, mothers and grandmothers, um, about childhood vaccines. 
And he was a homeopath. He was a medical doctor who used strictly homeopathy. And so I went there not knowing what homeopathy was. I thought it meant, you know, home remedies or holistic. Mm -hmm. And that is what is often misunderstood about homeopathy. No, no, nay, nay, nay. <laughs> homeopathy is a spe specific medical for, um, form. So I went to this lecture and he, and I've been to many lectures on, again, vitamins, supplements, botanicals. I'd been studying, I'd been going to classes, I'd been doing this for a good, I don't know, 10, 15 years. When I went to this lecture, this doctor turned my head in such a way, I said, oh my gosh, I think this is it. Mm -hmm. So that night I bought a little homeopathy kit. I still own it as a matter of fact, it's, it's 34 years old. Uh, a, a little homeopathy kit, which had 29 medicines in it and a book, a very simple book that was designed for the general public. Everybody's Guide to Homeopathic Medicines was the name of it. And, um, and I went home that night and I was very interested and I read the book and, and, and it, was, it was fascinating to me. But at this point I was pregnant with my baby shortly after the pregnancy. I did not employ homeopathy at all. I didn't know that it could be used for birthing, for, for moving a, a, the, the labor uh, process along a little faster to minimize pain during labor. It's, I didn't know any of that was possible with homeopathy. But when I uh, went to the, uh, uh, for his well baby checkup, let me just say that, well baby checkup. Mm -hmm. When I think back today, that was the only time I took any of my children to a medical doctor. And it was the last time. And you'll understand why. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that my baby was well. I needed someone else to tell me he was well. Did I not have common sense? Did I not have a mother? Did I not have many cousins? I have lots of cousins and aunts. Did I not? No. I thought I was doing the responsible thing and took my baby. And I told them, I want to postpone. I think I want to postpone the, the inoculations. Let's just wait a little while and let's just see how things go. He was six weeks old. Well, um, those direct directives, those re requests of mine were, were denied. And in came the nurse, probably not, not for any other reason, but this is what they do. She came in and plunked something in his mouth. I, he was in my arms. Whoa, 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 what's that? She said, oh, it's just his polio vaccine, dear. It's nothing to worry about. Well, I wasn't, I mean, I just said, what? What is this? I didn't come here for him to be treated. I came here to be, to find out if he was well. And then I realized how stupid I was. So I was very angry, but I didn't say anything because what could I do? There wasn't anything I could do. So well, come see, come saw, let's see how it goes. So two, three days later, my son, who was as healthy as can be and, and wholly nursed, by the way, it was, a very, it was a natural birth without any medication for either one of us. And um, two and a half days later or so, he got a fever of 105 point something. Very high for a six week old baby. And I thought to myself, hmm, where could this have come from? Uh, we knew, I mean, it was obvious. To be honest, it was obvious what had happened. It's not as though I, you know, took him places where there were very a lot of sick children. And by the way, I might add that when I went into the to that pediatrician's office, there were no other children in that room at all in the waiting room. There was I was the only one. I don't know why that turned out to be that way. So it wasn't an, as though my son, who was in a babe in arms, could have picked it up from someone sneezing or coughing on him or etc. So I knew what it was, but I didn't know what to do. And I also knew one thing. I was never going to go back to that pediatrician again. I hadn't decided I would never go back to any pediatrician, but I knew that one was out because they were not paying attention to what I had requested. Was so I had this book. I had this book. And there was nothing in there about what I would have called vaccinosis. Instead, it was a book of on everyday concerns, of children's fevers. It said the kinds of things that I teach now on my blog. Um, and I po and I held that book and I held my son and he refused to nurse. His fever was so high. He was so parched. He wouldn't nurse. And it went on for two days. Now, my, now, when I look back, I realize, and even just a few years later, I realized he could have gotten rather sick from dehydration. Um, but um, I watched the fontanelles because if the fontanelles start to sink, you're kind of in trouble or, the, or in this area as well starts to sink a little bit, they're truly dehydrated, but he would not nurse. 
So I went through the book and I looked under fever, fever. What? That's all he had was a very high fever. So I chose the fever based on one, one issue. And that was his breath had an odd odor. And so I chose the medicine sulfur 30 because that was the kit I had. It was a kit that had a 30th potencies in it. And I, and I got the sulfur 30 and I, I, I rationalized that this is the medicine for very high fever. It's particularly if there's a little bit of an odor and for a six week old to have an odor is very odd. So I put the pill down. This was two and a half days. My mother was with me. My dear friend was near, was in the kitchen with me too. I was on the rocking chair with them. My mother said, honey, you got to get to the hospital. You got it. No, I've got to figure this out. And I knew the answer had to be in that book on some level. I put the little pills in his mouth. These pills are the kind that dissolve instantly. I put them in his mouth and Katie, I'm going to say, I don't know, 40 minutes. I could feel him firming up in my arms. He commenced nursing. The fever adroitly melted. And that was that. I said, what is this stuff? I had been studying herbs and vitamins and supplements. I'd been making, I'd been wild crafting my own herbs. I mean, I was very involved in all of this. He would have been too young for me to give him an herb, generally speaking, that was in alcohol. I'd have to dilute a great, a great deal. But sulfur 30 just completely eliminated that extremely high fever. And that was it. Now, Today, he's going to be 34 years old. Would you believe he's not had a fever since? <laughs> Isn't that wild? Now, I'm not saying that's the reason, but that's an interesting concept that he came into the world six weeks old and had this tremendous fever and he hasn't had one since. Now, subsequently, I had two more children and I decided from that experience, it left such a bad taste in my mouth. I said, I'm going to do this myself. Now, let me also say concomitantly that if my child was in an accident, he broke a bone, he needed something that was outside of my ability. And even at that time, to be honest, it was almost outside of my ability because I really didn't know much. But if I deemed, I, I, I deem, who? Mom, I deem, not the school, not the government, not the governor, I the mother deem that this child needs their care. I will decide who, and then I will take them. It just never happened. Mm -hmm. Since that time, it never happened. Everything that came along for my children, I was capable of making the correction and working on it with them homeopathically. That is an incredibly powerful story. And the speed at which that worked, I can, I mean, I can see why you were a believer, you know, I mean, and your gut was already telling you, your, your mama gut was already telling you that. And for those of us who have no idea what homeopathy is, and, and I, like you, thought for a long time that it meant home remedies, and I mispronounced it for a very long time as well. How does homeopathy work? What are the basic underpinnings? There is the, 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 there is an understanding of the human body that there's always a correction that's trying to be made by the body. Now, had I left my son just to have that fever, um, it would have corrected. He was not going to live with a fever for the rest of his life. He would not have had brain damage. I know some people think that high fevers cause brain damage. That is not so. Brain damage can occur while concomitantly someone has a high fever, but the fever does not cause it. The fever will only go to a certain level in children and adults, but generally with children, it's about 105, 106, even up to 107, there is no brain damage. Now, I didn't even know that. And as I said, there was no internet for me to even look it up, but I had a gut feeling that I was not gonna go back to that, that office again after they dismissed what I asked specifically. And there was no, well, we'll just, we'll just go with that. So um, there, the, the, we understand that when a fever occurs, it's a good thing in many ways. It cooks off the virus. The heat does that. Just like people know that if you want to cook off something, you're, you're not well, you get into the sauna and you heat up and get good and high. It also happens to be a method for treating people who have cancer because the theory, there's a theory, uh, Dr. Thomas Cowan has put this out, and I think it's a well-founded theory, that people who have had suppressed fevers, what's a suppressed fever? Tylenol. What's a suppressed fever? Um, antibiotics. What's a, so anytime we use something that's a, 
synthetic that is intended to to stop the action of the natural response to the body it is called a suppression and do that enough times and his theory is that that is the cause of cancer later in life hence what he uses is heat therapy and they 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 create i don't know if he would use the word maybe he would call it the thermal therapy i'm not sure exactly his term but it's to mimic um, a fever bring that person to a fever, allow that body to blossom into hot, 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 uncomfortable. Granted, we know, we know fevers are uncomfortable. We get that, but we're looking at, okay, uncomfortable versus chronic illness. I'll go for uncomfortable. Right. You really boil it down. So um, that is, we know that there is a mechanism in the body to make the correction. If you eat bad chicken from a, from a, from a questionable restaurant, you know you're going to get diarrhea and you're going to vomit. Now, th that is an important thing. We want the contents of the stomach to get out. Now, could someone die from that? Yes, they could. But it, but is it likely? Not as likely as one might think. So if you get a cut, it bleeds, it cleans out, it cleans the, the, the wound. That is part of the mechanism of the body's ability to make the correction. Given that premise, what homeopathy does, because it is extremely gentle, it's highly diluted substances, it gently stimulates that mechanism in the body and makes the correction sooner. So it's that's pushing the, the body back toward, you know, the fancy word homeostasis, or maybe the common word back. Homeostasis, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yes. So the difference between, I'm just thinking about the fever, you know, the homeopathy, the sulfur, looked like it kicked the fever, just like Tylenol might, but you're saying Tylenol, is, is suppressing is unnaturally turning off the fever, whereas the homeopathy is, is using the body's mechanism to get the fever to its natural end. Is that a fair? You've got it. You've got it. Okay. Nice. I mean, it's, it's totally fascinating. I, I know when I first started um, dabbling in homeopathy, which I did for many, many years before I learned proper technique from you, I, I would I would search for homeopathy plus whatever I was experiencing in my family and my kids or croup or bloody nose or whatever. And I was very, very confused at the difference between the advice I was getting from you with what's called practical homeopathy or bandage protocol and classical homeopathy. So just for, for those of us, so that we're not super confused as we try to home doctor, what are the difference between the two? Classical homeopathy, you choose one medicine um, for many, many, many conditions. Someone might have, and it's usually uh, for chronic conditions. So if somebody has eczema, and they have anxiety, and they have insomnia, and they have um, um, dysmenorrhea, and they have um, uh, um, uh, gout. You you are in, you. The focus is to choose one medicine to cover all of it, hmm. and sometimes you can. Sometimes that's very possible when they line up, when these conditions line up properly. Um, and it's only used one dose or twice, maybe twice in, in a day and a half or so. And then you stop and you wait and you watch. The method that I use is what I've coined as practical homeopathy. And it's based a lot of on the Banerjee protocols, Dr. Banerjee, who I, who I had a fellowship with in, um, in India. And I went there eight years in a row and worked in their clinic and their research center. Um, they use a method where you use a medicine that is specific to the condition, not to the overall person. So the condition is, for my son, for example, is a fever. A fever that happens to have another aspect to it, which was there was a slight odor from his, um, from his mouth. So, but if you have all of those conditions con um, uh, that I just mentioned, and you choose one medicine, and you have to wait, and you only take, you only use one dose of it, or or a split dose twice in a day, then over a period of six weeks, you have to wait and hope that that person, that homeopath, chose the correct medicine. Whereas with this method, if my son also had eczema, we would have used the medicine for the fever. The eczema might have been helped with sulfur because sulfur happens to be a very good medicine for eczema as well. But let's say he also, well, of course, he wouldn't have had this as a baby, but let's say he had had an injury and he also had gout, et cetera, et cetera. I say we can use more than one medicine at a time. And what it does is it allows you to be able to treat this condition and get results mm -hmm. and also treat this condition. You might not get results on that one. You might've chosen the remedy incorrectly. 
and then you use this medicine for this condition and you have a much better chance of getting to the essence of the problems. So that I suppose in a nutshell, it's practical homeopathy is, is formulaic. It's much, much easier to wrap your head around. I was a classical homeopath for 15 years. I practiced for 15 full time, 15 years. I taught the first course in classical homeopathy. New York State was New York State approved for college level credit bearing course. And I will tell you, it was a very frustrating time for me. Um, I studied, I went to Toronto regularly. I studied with the finest homeopaths from all over the world, from Israel and Canada and Germany and the Netherlands and you name it. And I could not crack enough cases. I couldn't get to it fast enough. And that is the problem with classical. That's the essence of the problem. Once I started to employ the Banerjee protocols and other protocols that I had gleaned through the years and gave myself the freedom to use more than one medicine at a time, as well as using the and, and repeating the medicine more frequently, that's when I saw the grandest shift in my own practice and how I could teach mothers and grandmothers how to use this. It makes it much more practical. Which is, yeah, which is a perfect word. So it sounds like the, the practical homeopathy is faster. It's, it's easier. It's something you're able to do perhaps without a professional because classical is so complicated. You, you really must have. It's practical. Unfortunately, classical is what I would call recherche. It's esoteric. It's only for people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and spend, I don't know, 20 years, 15 years to try to figure it all out. This I can, you can read on my blog, Joe at Calabrese, um, high fever, Joe at Calabri strep throat. And you look it up and there it is. Here's the medicine. Here's the name of the homeopathic medicine. Here's the potency. Here's the frequency. And here's where you buy it. You can buy it wherever I direct you that, that we know that you can get it. Super easy. I agree. And I have searched many times, Joette and the name of the ailment that my kids are happening at least a dozen times just in the last six months. It's very, very easy. Are, are there any drawbacks? I mean, I, I love the sound of faster and easier, but sometimes that makes me feel like microwave, fast food, convenience food, you know, faster and easier. Are there drawbacks to, to doing? Well, I suppose one of the drawbacks might be that someone who is uninitiated in using homeopathy, they don't have a lot of experience with it, might try to use 50 remedies. Or they might say, well, I'll use this, and then I'll use that, and then I'll use this, and then I'll use it. And yes, it can make things a little messy. But um, the upside of that is that it brings people in who might not otherwise be interested in learning homeopathy. And I am not afraid of those kinds of mistakes. I don't ever encourage people to be sloppy. I want them to use, you know, edit, you know, you're going to choose the right medicine, just like an artist. And you look and you see too much yellow, too much blue. Okay. Back off. You, you, or, or when somebody's writing a, 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 a novella, you you want someone who is a wordsmith who knows how to kind of fine tune and really choose these medicines carefully and and judiciously. And once you learn how to do this, and it's not that hard, I teach children how to do this. Once you learn and you get kind of a little bit of the hang of doing it, it's like you're learning how to jump rope. Once you get in and you learn it, okay, now you're doing it. Now you're doing, you might have a misstep here and there, but you can get right back in again and start up again. That's great. And you know, at our family, because I dabbled for so long, I didn't see great results. And we have since seen some incredible results, powerful as you have. But I've also probably chosen the wrong remedy or, or just not been able to hit it very well. What do you say to people who feel like that ah, homeopathy doesn't work? I failed. I give up. Well, again, that's one of the problems with classical because it's so esoteric, so complex that people give up on. It. I can't tell you the number of my students who have come to me and said, you know, I was studying this 30 years ago. I gave up. So I went to doctors and I got drugs or I went to uh, botanicals, which is good. I went, I went another avenue because I just gave up. Well, I don't want to lose those people to other paradigms. I want them to find their way in homeopathy. And yes, there will be times when it will be difficult. There is no doubt about it. There are some conditions that are more complex than others. A cough can sometimes be more complex. But if you go to my blog and you look up cough for most people, it's pretty clear which medicines to use, what potency, what frequency, and for about how long. So in other words, yeah, just keep trying. Yes. Now, as parents, what have you got to lose? Well, so safety is a huge question, of course, as we're, as we're trying to figure things out for ourselves. So how, how do we know that homeopathy is safe, particularly when we're thinking about 
children, obviously you used it with your newborn, but what do we, what, how do we explain to people, yes, this is safe. It's okay that I use it. Yes, this is safe. It's okay to use this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's always interesting to me, and you're not coming from this paradigm, but a lot of people say, well, uh, how do I know it's safe? Well, have you ever used Tylenol? Well, yeah. Well, how do you know that's safe? Did you read the double-blind studies on Tylenol? How about Darvacet, which kills people? They had to take it off the market. How about, we, I mean, we could keep going with this. Homeopathy has never been taken off the market. We've never had a homeopathic medicine removed from the market, and it is, and it is under the, the, the tutelage of the FDA, in fact, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, for those who are not from the U.S. who might be listening to this, um, was actually begun in the 1940s by a, a, a medical doctor who was a homeopath because he wanted to be sure that the homeopathic medicines, medicines, these are not supplements, okay. medicines were, were, were protected. Um, now today, the FDA is a whole different kind of organization. It's like many of the other governmental agencies with three letters. So um, we have to be a little bit more careful of that. But homeopathy is had no medicine has ever been taken of homeopathic medicine ever been yanked off the market. How many conventional drugs have? Mm -hmm. I just looked it up the other day because, and I look it up regularly because to see if there's anything new that's that's come off. I mean, how about thalidomide? How about the pill? How about that pill? How about that? I know there are still many, many young women still using that. And I believe that it is the cause of a lot of hormonal problems that people, that women need to know about. That's not going to be told by your doctor because your doctor doesn't read the studies. The doctor learns from the pharmaceutical agent who comes in bearing chicken wings and donuts every Tuesday for Tuesday afternoon teaching. And the teaching is how to use these drugs. So the, the doctor trusts the rep. The rep trusts the company, the company, and we could keep going with this. And the company so is there to stop make and say, fun. I love the words you said. What did you say? You said, um, uh, you said personal agency, mm -hmm. personal agency in a world in which we live where there's a lot of, lot of unknowns more than ever. Now we're, now we're learning how many unknowns there are. Uh, we need to do our homework. And we should not go to conventional media because that's corporate media. It's corporate slash government media. No, 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 no. Go online. That's where you do your research. You go online and go to citizen journalists. Now, I don't know what you're going to find by putting that word in there, but you want to find people who are journalists who've been studying journalism and using it um, and their craft for many years, decades even, who have now pulled back and said, I can't work for that organization any longer. I've got to start telling people what I'm really finding out about what's been happening in our world for the last year and a few months. Mm, that's for sure. And I mean, the bottom line, I kind of love what you said is no homeopathic remedies have ever been pulled from the market. And pretty much any pharmaceutical drug has side effects. They are listed. They're documented. You've done this for 34, 36 years. You're not seeing side effects. You're not the type of person who would withhold those, right? There's not a whole lot of money in homeopathics. They're little vials for $12 or so. Um, this, this, isn't, uh, this isn't a big business pulling wool over our eyes. So that does, that does make me feel great. And, and let's get a little practical. Let's get a little practical. So moms are thrown lots of, lots of owies, lots of questions. And, and I think we can doubt ourselves. Gosh, do I, do I know how to deal with this? Do I need to call a doctor? Um, so, so what do you do with like kids who say ow in the night? Something hurts, like they, they, throw, they have a hurt leg or they can't sleep. Are there really common remedies that moms can have on the nightstand? Yes, yes, and they should know them. But if you don't know them, again, I'm gonna urge you to go to my blog, it's all free. And by the way, let me say parenthetically, it is not monetized. Even when I direct you to where to purchase the remedy, I do not get any kickbacks. When I say this is free, I mean this is free. I have no advertisers on my blog. That is not how I make my living. And that's, I want people to know that up front. Because if I were to, to make money every time someone bought a homeopathic medicine that I discuss on my blog or on my podcast or on my Facebook Live events, um, that would mean that I might discuss four, five, six, ten of them so that I could get people to buy them all and then I would make a percentage of that. That would taint my thinking. So from day one, I've said, no, I am not interested in that. 
So you can count on that. So in the middle of the night, if you just do Joe at Calabrese ear infection, Joe at Calabrese ear pain, Joe at Calabrese um, leg cramps, Joe at et cetera. And you do that, this is your free um, uh, site that I've had up for, I think it's 13 years, 12 or 13 years. Every Sunday I put out another blog with more information. Now, let me also say this, is it safe? I always say it is relatively safe. And the reason I say that is because um, um, is salt safe? Well, relatively, if you eat too much salt, you can cause kidney problems. Is drinking five gallons of water a day safe? Uh, no, I would say it's not. You could cause a lot of problems, mineral um, deficiencies, etc. So everything is relative. So as long as it's the directions are followed and the information is is understood and followed, then then it is, I would call it safe under those circumstances. Definitely fair. I know my mom always says information mixed with commerce makes for skeptical. So the yes. fact that you make it a point to just give and that this is this is your heart, this is your mission for the world, uh, that's really admirable. And we, we all appreciate that for sure. Um, are there, are there differences in the way you might help a child who has that temporary, right, that acute growing pain in the middle of the night versus something more chronic? Like I know in my family, we have environmental dust allergies and dairy sensitivities. Different in the way homeopathy is used practically? Well, the way, had my, my newborn not responded to that first dose of sulfur and I had read the directions properly in the book, I would have repeated it within... 15 minutes or in an hour or so. So the time in which it's repeated is closer because the condition is, uh, is in a more compressed space of time because a fever is not going to last for 30 years. A fever is going to last, generally speaking, for you know five days for a child. So because that's compressed, so is the repetition of the medicine repetition. It's, excuse me. So is the repetition of the medicine um, administration. So uh, when we're using a for a chronic condition, something that's long, long standing and could potentially last a lifetime, which most chronic conditions will laugh, last a lifetime, mm -hmm. then we're going to open it up and use it less frequently. So instead of every 15 minutes or every two hours, we're going to then use it maybe once a day or twice a day, depending on what that particular protocol calls for. And so we should look up, that's probably a good point to look up protocols rather than just saying, well, I'll try once a day or I'll try twice a day. No, no, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. You really want to stick with the directions. Mm -hmm. Like baking a cake. You want your cake to be perfect because it's your daughter's wedding cake that you're making. You're going to make sure the flour is the finest cake flour imaginable. You're going to use plugra butter. You're going to use the finest well-sifted salt, et cetera, et cetera, because it's very, very important. Mm -hmm. But if it's something that's not such a big deal, I'll whatever, we'll take it as it comes, then, okay, you throw two and a half cups of flour in your bowl, and then you add some salt and some baking powder, and you throw in the eggs and the butter, and you've done enough to, it might still work, but if it's really important, you want to follow directions. That's a great analogy. I know um, that all three of my boys have dust allergies, and we've got two of them on the immunotherapy drops, to be honest, and my littlest one, I, I thought, you know what? These doggone drops are taking two to three years anyway. I'm going to try the homeopathic regimen. And I believe it's every other day. And that is a little tricky. Sometimes we miss, but we're still hopefully, ideally, like this is a question just for all busy, crazy moms who go, oh, I didn't do it perfectly. Should I give up or should I just keep going? Because No, no, you keep going. Right you keep going. What I mean by the recipe, I'm talking about use the potency that, that I discuss mm -hmm. in the blog, use the potency that I discuss when I teach, um, follow the, 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 the path of twice a day. If you, for example, let's use yours every other day. It is easy to forget when it's every other day. It's not a big deal. That's the, that is that we understand that people have busy lives. And so that is, that's just a given. But again, it depends on how much that person is suffering. If that child is suffering so deeply that you can't wait to get to that every other day dose, you will not forget it. Sure. But if the child's doing all right, then, then you might miss it. Oh, I forgot a dose. Okay. We'll, we'll give it um, the next day instead. Yeah. Then, back on the horse. Here's my practical tip for any of you who are doing an every other day regimen is touch the vial every day and flip it over on the middle day 
and then flip it back on the day you take it. And so you always know which day was every other. So that's right. That's, that's right. Good point. So you mentioned you're creating a homeschool curriculum. I, I mean, I just, I'm fascinated by teaching this really kind of, kind of high level health agency medicine stuff. How do you shift things when you teach it to kids or do you? How do you, how do you change that? Well, what, when I teach our curriculum to kids, what I, I spend a lot of time teaching them how to treat their pets Aww. and livestock. Okay. Because that's where they have uh, a vested interest. That's where they have a lot of emotion. I, I, in the course again and again, I'm rem I remind these children, this is medicine. You have to work with your parents. Your parents have to know what you're doing. Um, and even when it's with your own pets. So I teach it how to, how to, how to deal with pets, especially injuries, because that's what pets often um, incur. And, and, and it, it's, if a child, and we had as children as young as nine or 10 years old, I believe in that course, it was really designed for about 12, 13, 14 plus. Um, but we did have some younger children who were capable enough to, to learn. So um, I, I know the emotion in having an animal that's been injured. And this allows that child to be able to treat their own animal. Well, that was just a great idea. And I, and I agree too. It's, it's sometimes it's so difficult to remember to, to teach the kids, right? This is medicine. Yes, you can take it yourself, but mom needs to know, or, you know, with my littler ones, I say, no, 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 you can't, you can't take medicine on your own. Even if I am talking about herbals, botanicals, or homeopathy, we want them to know that it's not a, it's not a free for all salad bar. So right. <laughs> that's, that's very important. Joette here at the Healthy Parenting Connector, we love to leave parents with a message of hope and optimism at the end of our episodes. Now, granted, this whole interview has been, I believe, very helpful because that feeling of having health agency is so primal. It's so important to me as a mom. And I just want to share that with others so that they can feel confident helping their own family stay healthy and get back to health. Uh, but what would you tell parents here at the end to kind of keep that optimism flowing, maybe a success story or some sort of message, message of hope from your heart to theirs? Yeah, my message is that Having the ability to be able to treat yourself and your family gives you something that you cannot buy, and that is freedom. Freedom from angst, freedom from being at someone else's beck and call, freedom from, um, uh, from others um, uh, looking over your shoulder and saying, what are you doing? What are you? No, if you know what you're doing and once you learn how to do this, it will give you the kind of freedom that you can't get anywhere else. It's all, and I'm going to do something kind of dangerous here. So hold on. So it is, this is what I call the torch of freedom. This is important ladies. And I know I'm mostly speaking to ladies because this is where it happens is in the home, in the hands of the mothers and the grandmothers. I want you to have freedom and personal sovereignty. Very key after the year that we've just spent. Had you known last year how to treat what was forthcoming, you would have had that freedom to say, I know how to treat that. I know what to do. That's what I want you to know how to do. In almost every circumstance. If, however, you don't know what to do, start treating on the way to the hospital or the doctor's office and, and find yourself a doctor that you can trust. Find a doctor you can trust that's on the same page as you. And so with that, I would say this is all, it's more about freedom than anything else. I love that. When, when you said the word freedom for the first time, I literally felt my, my heart bloom and my body shift into parasympathetic state. Like I just felt so at peace and inspired. And I appreciate that message. I know we all do probably more than you know, or perhaps exactly, exactly as much. I mean, you know, this is a very important message and it, it does feel good. It feels great. Every time I can say to my kids, I'll go look something up for that, or let me, let me find you something to help you with, you know, your owie, your scratch, your bump on the head, your growing pains, your shortness of breath, like all of those things. It feels so great it's true. to be able to help them. And so then that, that is, that is the gift that Homey up to give. So thank you so very much, Joette Calabrese. Everyone search up Joette Calabrese and the ailment you're, you're having. And I do encourage you to take her classes. Gateway to homeopathy is kind of the first one. Very simple, not very much of a time commitment, but hugely empowering for your life, your family, your motherhood, and your health agency. Thank you again, Joette. God bless all of you. Thanks for inviting me, Katie.
Absolutely. And audience, I will see you back next week for another episode of the Healthy Parenting Connector, where as always, I am here to help you raise healthy, independent adults by connecting you with the experts who have the information you need. Take care.